Hey, welcome into the Stinky Truth Podcast. We've got the leftover show from the game I called on Sunday. That was the Houston Texans at the Atlanta Falcons. I am Mark. That is Mike. And uh, Mike, how are you, buddy? I'm good. I'm good. Yeah. Yet, a, yet another good game. Although, I, I, I don't know if you heard about this, but there was some, uh, some fear out there. Maybe the viewers who are watching the game. In the midst of the game-winning field goal, uh-huh. your screen went dark for a second. Oh, and it came uh, right thought, back in time huh. for the ball to, to go through. But your dumbass uh, partner probably pushed a button. Did you? Did you? Did you kick a? Did big you fat kick, fingers did you on kick there? A, what, is, what does this button do? <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, exactly. Uh, no, I I did not push any buttons. I I did not know that it didn't go off. It didn't go black on in in yeah. the booth. Um, but what a what a game! And I'm telling you, what I came away from that game. Um, so impressed with a young team in Houston, a young coach in Houston. Hey, I, I know what I know what Atlanta is, and I know what they have to do to win. And they got back to being kind of Atlanta, and and I think Atlanta's got a good chance of winning that South Division. But um, but the Houston Texans are going to be a problem in the AFC South as well. So. Like, they're a good team. Well, let's start, because I think uh, I'm always curious about first-time head coaches. And you get a chance to meet with a D'Amico mm-hmm. Ryans. Uh, for all the Texan fans out there, who is this guy? I mean, they know um, him as a player right, for all right, those right, years. Right. But but what kind of vibe are you getting from him as a coach? Um, one, where he came from. So, obviously, he had success as a player. And he played in with the Texans, and he played with Philadelphia. And, and so he's had success as a player. Um, but I'm telling you, his time in San Francisco under Kyle Shanahan with uh, John Lynch, uh, with Robert Sala, with the coaches that he coached under and for, um, with the organizational structure, like you can, you know that he's got great, great mentors and a great understanding of what it's supposed to look like. So he comes into Houston and says, I don't really care what you guys did in the past. I don't care the way you operate in the past. This is how I know you have to do it to be successful because we've been to NFC championships. We went to a Super Bowl and had a lead with six minutes left. Like we've done it. So this is what has to get done. So he's learned that, you know, taking that page from the Niners, but he's not like, this is how we did it when we were the Niners. And this, it was like, this is what has to be done. And you get he, some examples. Oh yeah. Just talking about like, just talking about how, uh, he wants his team to play, how he wants to win the line of scrimmage on both sides, how he wants to set edges on the defense, and how they want to fly around, swarm to the football, and how you're going to make up for mistakes with hustle and effort. And so you watch their team play, you watch his team play, and they are exceptional when it comes to the effort they give on the defensive side of the ball. And I'm telling you, I don't know how long their guys are going to last on the edge. Jonathan Grenard, number 52, and Will Anderson, number 51. You want to talk about edge setting mothers, man. You want to talk about a couple guys. Will, I got my handy dandy notes here, is six foot four, two forty three, and Grenard is six three, two sixty. And let me just tell you, I am talking about taking three hundred and five pound, three hundred and twenty pound tackles and absolutely kicking their asses from low to high plane, just home, driving them into the backfield. And they ran a play, the Atlanta Falcons ran a play that they had been wildly successful on the week before. They got into what we call 20 personnel. So they got a fullback and a tailback and then three wide receivers. And they ran um, like a weak counter stutter, some people call it. So they ran stutter from a fullback wide receiver you know, tight formation. So they had the fullback, the tailback, under center, right? And they all step this way, and the fullback leads, and then, or the the center, excuse me, erase that. (laughs) So they, they did it with the center and that backside puller. So they did the center, led, and the backside wide receiver became a puller through the hole. And the center comes out, and Will Anderson comes down the line of scrimmage 
and they get a holding call on it. Will Anderson put his helmet in the center. Drew, uh, it's uh, Drew Dolman. He's uh, six foot three, three hundred five pounds. Put his helmet square in the guy's chest and drove him ass over tea kettle. He falls down on top of him, and you know, my producer's in my ear going, "Oh, that's a holding call." He pulled him down. I go. I was like, that is not a whole, I said on television, I go, that is not a holding call. He snatched his soul from his body. <laughs> like, it was just an absolute ass whipping. But that's the way they play. Um, unbelievable aggressiveness all over the football field, downhill in the running game. I'm telling you what, they are so good. But I think the big takeaway, if you're the Houston Texans right now, there was so much made of C.J. Stroud. Right, that was the big that was the big talk. And remember, when C.J. Stroud was coming out, he had one of the worst wonder lick tests, whatever it was, right? And it was awful, and people were really downplaying C.J. Stroud and this, that, and the other. And one, Mike, if I was in charge of the Players Association, there would never be another guy that took a wonder lick test ever. First and foremost, man, that is supposed to be confidential. And the fact that it gets leaked every single year, Always. up your up your ass, man. You are not having my guys take one. They won't do it. Absolutely not. And then on top of that, like you want to talk about a test that really has no bearing on your football acumen, your football knowledge, and this kid, articulate, smart, understands the game, knows exactly what he wants to get. And when you talk to his coaches, man, um, he has got unbelievable footwork, works at it every single freaking day. And he's one of those guys, they talk about the growth process from when he came in after the draft to where he is now as a quarterback. Like he's got this ability to bank reps. So he takes a rep and has it banked in his head and never makes the same mistake twice and takes pride in not making the same mistakes. And I'm telling you what, timing, accuracy, anticipation with the ball. Mike, and you watch him read front side progression to get to the back side. I mean, it's like boom, boom, bam, right now. The guy is the guy is incredible. Man, I just enjoyed the heck out of watching C.J. Stroud operate. I thought he was tremendous. I thought the Houston Texans were great. Um, and they've done this, by the way, with four different combinations of offensive line because they've had so many different injuries up and down the line of scrimmage. So you've done all this stuff with limited reps, limited guys, and a rookie quarterback. They're sitting at two and three right now. They are they are a good football team, and they are an improving football team. Meanwhile, that's the team that lost. Yeah. So let's talk about the team that won in Atlanta. You've seen them play a, a, a couple times. Yeah, twice w now. Was... Did you see something different? Did you see a next level, go to that next level performance from Desmond Ritter? Yeah, I did. And he, like he talked about, you and I have talked about footwork, the importance of footwork and how you how you throw the ball with your feet, you know, and how you've got to be compact. And we talked about, we talked about Brock Purdy in our podcast. You can check that out. And da -da -da -da, you know, his feet are always just underneath him. And CJ Stroud, when I talked to Bobby Slowick, who is the offensive coordinator for the Houston Texans. Now, Bobby, you got to understand, comes off that Shanahan tree. Yep. That Shanahan tree, he started on the defensive side of the ball. Yep. But back when Kyle Shanahan was there, McVay was there, Lafleur was there, Mike McDaniels was there, Bobby Sloak was also there. And he was there. Uh, he was on their defensive staff. Um, actually started as a film guy. Went to the defensive staff and became part of the defensive staff. And then, I mean, then he's transitioned into the offensive you know, realm. But... He talked about C.J. Stroud's feet and how quick his feet are and how good his feet are and, that, and how the fact that, you know, he's probably ahead of Brock Purdy when it comes to footwork stuff, where Brock Purdy is not now, not ahead of him now, but ahead of him when he was a rookie versus Brock being a rookie. So that footwork stuff is, is so good. And so when I talk to uh, Desmond Ritter, Desmond Ritter said, my number one problem is I'm a big, lanky guy. And I was always a shotgun guy at Cincinnati. So being under center, the play action stuff under center, that's hard for me. Like, like that stuff requires work, and you've got to think about how your footwork, war, uh, you know, is operating. And the other thing is I've got to shorten up all my strides because I tend to be, you know, too big, 
too big of strides and things. So it's it's really tightening things down and making sure that my feet are underneath me all the time. And really watched him with eye discipline and quickness in feet, you know, really throw the ball with a lot more accuracy, a lot more timing than he has in the last couple of weeks. Now, the biggest thing for the Falcons on the offensive side of the ball, Mike, honestly, is know who you are. Know what your identity is. Get back to just being a bully up front because they they can do it. That's the way they are operating. They've got a big time fullback in Keith Smith, Michael Michael Pruitt, uh, Janu Smith, the tight end. Like they can block you up on the edge, um, and they've got two running backs in and Robinson and obviously Algier that they can flat out get that stuff done. So they have to bully you up. That's who they are. Lean on you a little bit. Chris Lindstrom is one of the best guards in football coming off the ball. So, so that's who they are. Like Caleb McGarry, their right, their right tackle. He is a the wide zone Viking. That you know that he should be on that that. What's that? What was that show? Like like the Brothers of Anarchy or something, right? Or Sons of Anarchy. Sons Sons of Anarchy. He's just like a big old Viking. He's like a big old giant. Like right from you know in the boat, you know with the helmet on and. What do they carry? They carry like a big axe. Yes. That's what he looks like. Like he is very Nordic, huh? Yeah, right? oh, or incredibly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, six six, three hundred and fifty. You know, that's who he is. So just let him come off the ball and smash people in the helmet. Like that's what he does well. So that's who they have to be, and they've got enough talent with Drake London and a couple other guys at the receiver position to be. They, they can be really Kyle good. Kyle Pitts. Kyle Pitts drafted is, very high to be right. a real game record. And he's a he's a tight end that really is a wide receiver. Sure. So that's kind of the way he plays. So yeah, they've got they've got the requisite talent um, to be to be a good football team, and and actually in my mind to win that okay. NFC South. All right, I was going to ask you what what the ceiling is for them. Yeah. Absolutely. I, oh, I think they're an NFC South contender. And then what they've done on the defensive side of the ball, um, they went out and got uh, defensive coordinator Ryan Nielsen, and he was with the Saints for a long time. Man, they have tied that defense together so well. They really do up front. They play really good football. Uh, David Onyemata is a Big-time beast, Calais Campbell, in his 16th year. He started 212 games over the course of his career. Uh, Grady Jarrett's one of the most underrated, you know, one of the most underrated defensive linemen in football. I think their back end is really good. Terrell, Okuda, you know, both first-round picks. Richie Grant, Jesse Bates. Like, they're a really good football team um, on, on you know, the front and the back end level. So since this is the leftover show, anything you do, well, all this prep work for both teams, anything that uh, you found interesting in meeting with coaches, players that didn't make its way into the, the broadcast that everyone had a chance to watch, maybe yeah. one from each team? Yeah, I think I think one of the things, and, and I really didn't, I really wanted to get into it in the broadcast, but it really didn't have a chance. Um, sometimes things just don't pan out the sure. way you think they're going to pan out. But one of the coolest things that I've and I've never heard this anywhere. You know, you always hear about the gap assignment defense and how we're a one gap defense. So, one of the things that Ryan Nielsen, who is the you know all, defense coordinator of uh, Atlanta, he talked to us about was, hey, listen, I play a one gap defense except on the front side of zone. So one of my guys wears a two gap hat, and so it's either number ninety, David Onyemata. Or it's number 93, Calais Campbell. When you're on the front side of like a wide zone, I want my front side guy to to basically stack the offensive lineman and play both the C and D gap. And then the rest of everybody has got a one gap assignment. And I'll be honest with you, I've never heard anybody coach that way. I've never heard that in, hmm. in all my time. And I played defense all through college. Yeah. Um, before I switched over, you know, to the offensive side my last year. So I've never, and I've never heard any coach in all the years I've been, you know, broadcasting for both ESPN and Fox, I've never heard anybody talk about that. So I thought that was a really unique kind of takeaway from um, from the Falcons and kind of one of the things they do that's a different kind of quirky, you know, just kind of quirky aspect cool. to what they're doing. Um, so let's, let's flip it over to uh, Houston Texans and – their offensive kind of their offensive strategy. One of the things their offense coordinator Bobby Slowick talked to me about was we've really gone away from one of the things you hear all the time is um, middle of the field open, middle of the field closed. 
So are you in a are you in a tent structure or two two safety structure? That's middle of the field open. Are you in a single high? So two safeties you can play you know cover two cover four cover six you know you can you can manipulate those things in one high safety you play cover one or cover three um and essentially saying hey man one of the things we've done with our quarterback have we gone more to a straight progression read so yeah you can look at the safeties and get an ideal of of idea of what they're going to be in but don't eliminate something don't predetermine. So one of the things he talked about is we're a pure kind of a pure progression read offense, right? Anticipate the coverage by middle of the field open or middle of the field close, right. but don't predetermine. Go through your read. So even if it's cover two, and this is good against cover two, still read it out. Boom, boom. One, two, bam. Backside. And CJ Stroud has been exceptional in that. Um offensively. I think one of the things you're seeing for Atlanta offensively, obviously Desmond Ritter, I talked about his footwork. I talked about kind of the eye placement, uh, being on time and all those kind of things. But Bajon Robinson, number seven, you you cannot get the ball in that guy's hands enough. You love this guy. Oh, my gosh. Like the plays that he is capable of, find him, find him spots in space. But I think the other thing that is – He's one of those dudes, you know, everybody worries about how many touches do we give him because is he going to get hurt? Uh, he's McCaffrey-esque mm. in – Christian McCaffrey can run the ball between the tackles, yep. but he rarely takes – when he does that, he rarely gets squared up. Right. Very, It's not very often that Christian McCaffrey gets squared up. He's gelatinous in his ability to, to only allow you a glancing blow when you make a tackle in between the tackles, you know, when you hit him in between the tackles. And I think Bijan Robinson has that same quality, that gelatinous quality where you never get a great shot on him. And so I'm like, get this guy as many touches as possible. And then on the defensive side for the Texans, man, it really, it really is rotation. And this comes from San Francisco. This comes yeah. from Philadelphia. It's that rotation of your front, your front eight guys constantly rotating through those guys. And then your ability to set edges – Mike, their edge setting is honestly in in all the years I've been calling games. That's the best edge setters I have seen in football. Wow! Like it is, wow. it's like it's frightening. Like they didn't. Atlanta just got shoved in the backfield on a consistent basis, and um, you know at the end of the game they started leaning on them, putting some drives together. Um, because it, you know, it just it, it it's what happens when you lean on people in the run game. But their ability to set edges was ridiculously good. So, um, really fun stuff. Two teams that I think at the end of the day in the AFC South and NFC South respectively are going to have a chance to be right there in the end. Um, you know, maybe winning that division. Both Houston and Atlanta, I think, have a chance to do that. All right. All you right. got to see them. Yeah. It was fun to see them. I got Houston versus the Saints this weekend. All right. Next weekend, I travel out to Tampa, and I'll get Atlanta there again. So um, You're on the beat. I, I'm on the beat right now. There's no question <laughs> about it, which Falcons is nice. Beat. Yeah, I don't, you know what? That gives me uh, – not that there's less work because there's always work to be done. But anyhow, Work's that's harder. the leftover show for us. Hey, man, if you like the content you see, make sure you uh, give us that thumbs up. Also, hit that subscribe button so that uh, you can follow us for more content like this. And, and make sure you hit us up in the questions or in the comments section because I'd love to follow you in the comments section and uh, get back to you on that as well. All, All right. right. See you next week. What, no, what are you? I, I sent you something. To, oh, you want me to read that? Also, yeah. don't forget to uh, follow us on social media to this stay up to right here, right? date on our latest updates. Links are here in the description. Again, thank you for watching. We'll see you again later in the week. All right, guys. For everybody involved in the Stinky Truth Podcast, we appreciate you. We'll see you later on in the week. Hey, for everybody involved in the Stinky Truth, we thank you so much. Thank you for watching. Uh, if you enjoyed the video, please make sure you don't forget to give us a thumbs up. Subscribe to our channel for more content just like this. If you want to see more of our videos, you can also be sure to check out our playlist. Let us know exactly what you think in the comments below. Uh, we appreciate you guys so much for being a part of that. Don't forget to follow us on social media to stay up to date on our latest 
updates. Links are in the description. Thanks again for watching, and we'll see you in the next video.